Romans chapter 2. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same thing. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? What came to my mind was, I think it was about four months ago, five months ago, there was a friend of mine, I won't mention any names, uh, that I've known here locally. And I hadn't heard from him for ages. Actually, two friends I hadn't heard from for ages. And when I called, they either seemed to be busy or they just text. And I said, okay, I'm going to leave them alone. I can tell. This is my judgment now. I'm going to leave them alone. I can tell they don't want to be bothered. <laughs> well, time went on, time went on. I found out that one of them was taking care of a dying relative. And another one had a relative that had come on with some sickness in their body. And they were 24-7, had to quit their job and everything. I had no idea the two of them were going through. No idea. And I'm sitting up there thinking about me, thinking about myself like a big old baby. I guess they don't want to be bothered with me no more. <laughs> yeah, I went through that. I went there at 67 years old. I went there. Sometimes we have to really consult with God or, as the Bible says, if you think somebody got something on you, He's got something against you, got an issue, call them up and ask. Or just see how they're doing. You might find out why they haven't had time to be bothered with you. I was, I was ashamed of myself, y'all. I was ashamed of myself sitting up here doing inner healing ministry and still dabbling in my own self-pity. Hmm. Okay, that's my confession for the day. <laughs> okay, let's go to Psalms 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Verse 3. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old, through my roaring all the day long. For day and night, thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters, they shall not come nigh unto him. Wow. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. And then here's God's promise. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. I'm going to stop there. See, a lot of times, the word that jumped out at me from that was the word guile. <clears throat> and sometimes I find myself, I have to catch myself, because I was raised by a master manipulator. And even though I hate manipulation with a vengeance, I hate it. I hate it when I see it in me. I hate it when I see it in anybody else. I still find myself tipping over in that direction sometimes. And I have to ask, oh, Lord, forgive me. I just saw what I was trying to do. I heard myself go there. Now, a lot of times when we do that, it can be a very small sign, a subtle sign that we lack a little. In some areas, we lack confidence in God, even though we believe in him, we trust him and all that. There's some areas where we're like, well, Lord. 
Well, Lord, what you doing, Lord? I'm looking at my clock. I see the time moving, but I don't see your hand doing anything. What are you doing, Lord? Are you doing anything? Am I even on your mind? Yeah, we go there. So then when we deal with people, we try to make people do what we want them to do. And we'll say things and do things and insinuate and bring up a subject and all of that to try to make them think about stuff. I catch myself doing it. I ain't, I ain't just preaching it, y'all. <laughs> I'm just as guilty. What I'm trying to say with that, the word guile, I looked it up. I, I just, I'm one of those people I like milking a word until there's nothing left. It has to do with manipulation. I was shocked. I was like, guile. I'm thinking guile is hard feelings. Nope. It is manipulation, control, wiliness, trickery, underhandedness. I'm just trying not to take up time by going through reading it all. But it was really interesting to see and as I was reading some of the words, I could see myself. And I said, boy, we don't even realize how quickly we slide into that. It's such an easy tool to use when we want somebody to do what we want them to do. When we want the outcome to turn out this way. When we want them to understand something. Wow. So I have to constantly ask the Lord to keep me down. You know how they say, uh, stand down, stand down. I got the gun pointed at you, stand down. Yeah, I ask God to help me stand down from Pat. And that's one of the things that we do as human beings. Saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, that with a mighty burning fire. And we still yeah. trip over our own two feet. It's the craziest thing. So I'm constantly asking God to forgive me when I see those tendencies. I was raised by a family of outgoing people. I mean, I think there's only one person in our family that's shy, and that's my brother Frank. Everybody in my family is outgoing and mouthy and talkative. And <laughs> yeah, and we have bold and and outgoing personalities. We're not shy, but we also tend to be manipulative too. It is a family trait. Maybe it's just a human trait, but in my family, it came straight from mamacita. And you know that old expression, the fruit don't fall far from the tree. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we got it on us. But I fight it. I fight the tendency to manipulate. It is a, it's one of those real subtle battles that if you're not paying much attention to yourself, you fall into that every time because it goes with your flow. It can get done what you want done, the way you want it done, when you want it done, to the extent that you want it done. And we don't realize how easily we do that. And I mean, the Bible talks against that. We don't hear much about manipulation in church. We don't hear about that sin. But that hit me when I, I said, why is he leading me to Psalms 32? Right? I know what it says. He done ministered that to me so many times. But I forgot about the word guile. And I'm reading it, the first and then the second verse. Whoa, let me look that up. Whoa, why is that jumping out at me? What do you want me to say about that? Some of the things we do are a very strong indication that we do not trust God like we think we do, like we say we do, like we believe we do. And the reason I say that is because I learned firsthand God knows me way more than I know myself. And he will tell me the truth about me I didn't even know. And then when he goes down memory lane, I realized just how right on he is. And I didn't have a clue. So there are times when God wants us to check certain things in our personalities. 
One way of manipulation. Let's go down the list of the different ways we manipulate. Guilt trips, baby. Guilt trips, making somebody feel bad about what they did do, what they didn't do, what they said, what they believe, what they don't believe. We want them to feel guilty. We want them to feel like a low down, dirty dog. We want to put our repentance on them instead of letting God lead them to repentance. We want to work that repentance. I'm going to show you how low down you are, baby cakes. And that's what we do. That That's a sin. In all honesty, I don't know if I've ever heard manipulation preached on. And I've been saved since 1981. But this is what God told me to preach on. That word jumped off that page and slapped me in my face. It got me first. So I had to deal with me before I dealt with anybody else. And some of that comes from judgment. We judge each other. We have preconceived notions. I believe that so-and-so said that because they really meant the other. Why do I believe that? Because I still need healing. And I'm oversensitive. So I start seeing the boogeyman. There ain't no boogeyman around. Nobody else knows about it either. And then I react to the boogeyman. And I don't react to what he said. I react to what I think he said. Or what I think he meant. Anyway, so we have to be careful. Friendships can be cut short by preconceived notions. Friendships can be cut short. It can be eliminated. It is it is a something because a lot of us, we don't talk about it. What we end up doing, in essence, or inadvertently, what we end up doing is we have a preconceived notion and we read something in. My mother used to always tell me, read between the lines. But some of us read into the lines. It's like if Lynn tells me, oh my goodness, I saw your picture last week. You look like you lost some weight. Now, if I was the Pat I was 30 years ago, I might think in my mind, yeah, she telling me I'm still big and fat. I just look a little better. And I'm reading a whole dialogue in there that probably never even occurred to her. So that's a form of judgment. Because I have decided what she meant. And I'm at it. I got an attitude based on what I thought she meant. Not what on what she said. But what I thought she meant when she said what she said. And then after I go through the reactionary thing, then when we talk, I start to talk about people who pick on people who are overweight. And what I'm really trying to do is cause her to feel guilty for reminding me how fat I am. When all she was trying to do was give me a compliment. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? The judgment and the manipulation, they almost, I never really saw it like this before. I'm, I'm, I'm getting this right hot off the press as we're talking. They almost go hand in hand. And it comes through interpersonal, rea uh, 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 interpersonal relationships. If I'm talking, let's say, let me see who's on here. Who can I pick on? You see, don't say nothing. Just let me look. Because I'm still in the middle of the message, but I just want to see who's on. Okay. Okay. So let's say, okay, let me pick on Andrea. I like picking on her. She can take it. Okay. If I tell Andrea, Andrea, I saw a chick go down the street the other day and I swore it was you. She had those same kind of locks that you wear. And her hair was even a little longer and a little thicker than yours. Oh, I was thinking to myself, boy, does Andrea look beautiful. Let me try to get her attention. Then she turned around and I saw it wasn't you. Now, if I told Andrea that, and Andrea had insecurities about her hair, <laughs> listen, listen, and she knows 
I tell her all the time, I love the way she looks in her locks. And her hair is growing so pretty. Just really works. But now I said that about a woman that I didn't know thinking it was her. Andrea could go home feeling sour because I thought she looked beautiful. Why? The woman's hair was thicker. The woman's hair was longer. So that would tell Andrea if she was full of insecurities, you know, uh, huh, uh, your hair ain't really long enough. You'd look a lot better if you look like her. I mean, now, I wouldn't have meant that, but can you see how people can read in to what you said? And then the next conversation we had, she could have called me talking about how uh, members of her family always put her down about her hair. When she's really trying to tell me, you really put me down. I heard what you said and I heard what you meant and I didn't like it. But she doesn't have the nerve to say it, so she talks around it. She beats around the bush, insinuating. See, God, I don't know how to say this. I've seen friendships fall by the wayside. Lifelong friendships die. Family members stop talking to each other. Church members turn a blind eye to each other because of these two sins. Judging that preconceived notion type of judging, and the other one is manipulation. Guile. Guile. Oh! Okay, I'm not going to be long, but I'm just sharing. I'm trying to break it down in real life situations so you would get it. Here's another one. When I was a little girl, my father used to, if we were playing catch, he bought me a, a catcher, a catcher's mitt. And we would play catch. He'd throw the ball. Now, this is the way you catch the ball, Patty. And, da, da, da. and we go back and forth. He was athletic and I was athletic, so I loved it. But I noticed if I did something really good, he wouldn't say that a girl. He'd say that a boy. <laughs> now, if I had been insecure and not certain of his love for me as I am, I could have grown up with a real insecurity thinking, deciding, reading into that, that phrase of his, my father wanted a son. He didn't want no girl. And I could have turned bitter behind that. That was just his turn. It was a turn. It had nothing to do with who I was. That was his turn. So, oh my goodness, I don't know how to say, I don't know how to put this so to make you guys see it. But sometimes God wants us to deal with some of the most subtle things. The subtle things. Ah, you can cause a leak or a pipe to break from a constant drip, 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 drip. And you think it's not going to do any harm. You just leave it alone. But one day you're getting ready to turn that faucet off and the washer is gone because you let it go so long and the water is just gushing and you cannot turn that bad boy off. Now you got to call a plumber. Something you could have easily handled with a simple washer yourself, but now you got to call a plumber. See, things can cost you in life. Because of being judgmental and being manipulative. Things can cost you big time. You can manipulate people so much they grow to hate you. They know you're going to try to make them do something this way. Make them do something that way. They can't be themselves. Because they got to be a junior you. And do it your way. Or you ain't happy. And you make their life miserable. Not everybody. Some people are very slight in their manipulation. Some people are grandiose like my mother was in manipulation. But either way, the Bible talks against it. That's crazy. I never dealt with that before. And I never heard anybody else deal with it. To my memory, now they may have. Maybe I fell asleep. But I don't remember hearing a sermon on guile.
and being judged. I've heard sermons on being judgmental, but not on guile. So when you guys are asking God to show you what's in your heart, and I ask him that all the time about me, and that's how I found out. I still got manipulative ways that I have to avoid. I run from like the plague. The same way I battle a cold before it gets in my body, I battle those, those little fleshly tendencies. They're sins, but we tend to call them tendencies, characteristics, idiosyncrasies, sin. That's the quickest way to call it. Acknowledge it. Ask God to forgive us and change us and move on. Anyway, that's the message. And I hope it encourages you to, to fine tune. It's in the, in the fine details. It's the little cracks that can tear up a building. The little cracks in the foundation can cause major problems. Just like they say, the little foxes spoil the vine. Anyway, God bless you as you get rid of your little foxes, and God bless me as I get rid of mine. Amen? Amen.